Hey. Valerie. All right. Take it away, Valerie. Okay, let me get the meeting re being recorded message done. All right, so I'm going to hazard a guess because I am from Nevada and I'm the betting woman that no one would say meetings are their favorite activity uh, of any day, even back in the day when we actually saw people in, in real life. Uh, but especially now that we're all virtual, we lose a lot when we go from the face-to-face -face interactions and meetings that we were used to, to this weird kind of virtual disembobulated head floating around kind of experience. The problem is now that a lot of us are working remotely and we uh, don't go into an office at all, a virtual meeting is really the only way that we can actually get things done in an ace in in a synchronous kind of experience. Um, it's also typically in the current climate, the only way that we actually see our colleagues anymore. And in fact, in many workplaces where they've done pandemic hiring, uh, if they're lucky enough to actually find someone to hire, people haven't even met in real life. In fact, our experience, we all, most of us only know each other through this virtual interaction. So while meetings are sort of a drag that we all force ourselves through, we actually get a lot of really efficient and good work done in them. It's often our only lifeline to our workplace and our only connectivity to other people we work with. So I think it's important to not just think, okay, well, we've changed the format, but not the style of how we have meetings, because virtual meetings are vastly different than in-person meetings, and it's much more than just the format. So before we really get started too much, I want to ask you to tell me what you think has changed in your experience in virtual meetings. Probably less of a formality. I think uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a push to wear your suit every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of the transition meant that people, business on the top, pajamas on the bottom type. <laughs> right, the Zoom shirt. Uh, at least people uh, would take showers at the beginning. Maybe that fell off a little bit. All right, what else? What else do you notice with the difference? I mean, if we're gonna say, okay, here's a virtual meeting, here's a face-to-face -face meeting, what are the differences that you've experienced? I notice that people are not, um, they don't look at the screen oftentimes and they also turn their screen off. So it feels like there's a disconnection during meetings. All right, so this lack of, of connectedness is, is a huge thing I think that we all experience. Anybody else have some ideas about what you have sensed as different? Well, related to that, in, in, in my experience, I don't see the emotional response. The, I don't get the full um, interpersonal connection right. that I do with face to face. Right, absolutely. We actually sometimes get no interpersonal connection because, as Debbie said, people just turn off their screens. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of things that have changed, um, much more than simply that we're looking at a screen rather than being in a room in a physical space. We don't have that body language that we're able to read. So when people are holding themselves tightly or they're really open or they're turning to face someone that is inviting conversation, we don't get any of that body experience. We also can't really see eye gaze. It's really hard when you're looking at a gallery, uh, especially if it's a large meeting. You don't either look at the people that the eye gaze might be useful. You might not see a screen at all because people have their video off. Um, also, it's hard when you're looking at 20 people to know where to look. Uh, so you don't get that instantaneous experience that you do in person when someone's looking at you and you can kind of tell they're focused on you or they're looking at someone else and you get a hint that you should look over there for some reason. There's also a lot of social cues that we miss when we don't have that physical space that's shared. For example, head nodding, head tilting, who people are sitting by. Um, that tells us a lot of how to read the room. We just can't read the room when we're on Zoom. The other problem I think some of you mentioned is everybody's in their sort of silo, their isolated space. Uh, there are a lot of, of other things that are going on. As Debbie said, people are sometimes not even looking at the screen. They're checking their email. They're looking at something on the paper. They're thinking about what they're having for lunch. So we tend to be in silos that are connected through this one little, little portal, but yet our physical space has a huge impact 
on our mental space. So where we're at in the, in the meeting in terms of our psychological processing of what's going on in the space of the meeting versus the space of our physical environment. Um, of course, then there's the final problem that when we're on meetings all day on a video screen, experiencing those sort of dis, uh, related kinds of experiences of being in two spaces at once, it's exhausting. Paying attention to two different spaces is exhausting and we tend to disengage. So there are a lot of problems with virtual meetings that we didn't have in face-to-face -face meetings. Of course, some of the benefits are that you can be in these two spaces at once. So a lot of us have found this also very convenient, um, but it's convenient at a cost. And I think that's what I want to talk to you about today is how can we make up these really positive and fruitful interactions um, that were valuable for both our, our, our psychological health and also our workplace um, productivity that we used to have when we ran into our colleagues um, outside the bathroom, in the kitchen, by the break room or outside of the meeting or even at the beginning of a meeting when we could have some interaction. So let's start with what we can do to make these experiences better and build these relationships a little stronger. So uh, probably a lot of you have heard of the Justin Timberlake song that says, let's bring sexy back, or I wanna bring sexy back. I wanna bring small talk back because one of the biggest losses that we've had with this shift towards a virtual space is we don't talk to each other in the ways that we used to that we're just checking in, just, forging a common bond, just having a basic social interaction, just paying attention to the fact that we need to treat each other as human beings, as social beings, and establish some sort of common ground. And this is what we did previously in our, our, our real life or <laughs> in meetings with fat at communication, because it was the norm when you walked into a meeting and there's a bunch of people sitting there to make some small talk. It was very awkward if you didn't. Um, we don't really do that when we're on Zoom a lot of times, especially in meetings where we might not have met in person or there's a lot of people from a workplace that don't know each other. I've been on meetings where people literally just sit and stare at each other or stare at the screen or look down the entire time prior to the start of the meeting from the meeting organizer. This is a loss of a real opportunity to get some sort of social interaction built between us and to build a common ground that will make us a team that makes us more effective in a workspace. When we look at communication research that studies how ties between employees either promote or um, disenfranchise workers or promote positive work environments. What we find is when we have the reports of weak social ties among employees, then it actually inhibits knowledge sharing at meetings. Um, when you're not really sure what someone's going to do with the knowledge that you're bringing to the table, you may not be willing to share it because you're worried it will be used in a way that's not helpful to you or not the way you intended, or you're just awkward at sharing that information because you don't know the people, you don't feel safe sharing it. So when we look at the research that studies strong ties between employees, what we find is the opposite occurs. When employees report feeling psychologically safe and valued, that increases knowledge sharing and idea generating at meetings. So we actually see a direct correlation between the relationships that we can form with each other on a social level and the productivity and output that we get in a, in a virtual, I mean, in a meeting space. And now this is in real life and in virtual life. But I think what the difference is, we have lost the ability that we had in real life to have this type of small talk that helped us establish a connectivity and helped us feel safe with each other. Um, it's very inhibiting when you get on Zoom. A lot of us are not comfortable talking in public spaces, especially when a camera is pointed at us and our face comes large on the screen. And so when we shift to this virtual only in our interaction, what it has caused is us to stop talking to each other as people and only talk to each other as workplace employees. And this is a really big problem because important work gets done with small talk. A lot of times we share ideas without even meaning to. So if you run to each other at the break room or in the kitchen, you might be sharing chit chat and then you say something like, oh, you're working on that project, right? You know, I have that question for you. So we build actually workplace conversation into our small talk. And so FATIC communication really needs to be brought back to the forefront of our interactions and meetings. The question is, how do we do this and still get work done? 
Well, there are a number of different ways we can approach this problem. One is we can make time for phatic communication. We can build it into every meeting that we have. And we can do this both as a meeting organizer, so those that are in charge of the meetings, or as a participant by how we behave in the meetings. So if we make time at every meeting to have some social checking in, some ice breaking introductions, we encourage conversation among colleagues. This can really go a long way in making the meeting better for everybody and making everybody feel psychologically safe to actually speak in those meetings. Another thing that we find is when you are looking at a large gallery, it's easy to feel disconnected. We don't really get that experience of talking one on one of actually knowing any individual in this large gallery that we're looking at. So another really effective way to make us feel more socially connected is to put us in smaller Break, breakout rooms. What we find is when we're talking to two people or three people instead of 20, we actually do forge some social connections. We feel more uh, compelled to make some chit chat to get to know each other a little bit before we start the meat of the meeting. And this can really help if we start doing these smaller breakouts in part of our larger meeting spaces to let each other to let us get to know each other a little bit and then we're more willing to talk in front of each other both because we have some homophily meaning we have some experience that tells us we're connected we're shared we have an uh, idea of who the other person is but also we're more familiar with more people on the call and we are less hesitant to speak in front of people we know than we are in front of strangers another option that people can can utilize is to actually have fat communication meetings um, instead of work meetings, which simply means let's do stuff that's fun. Let's not only have conversations about work, let's build in time to meet either outside, outside of work. So you can do this in actual real space, real time, or even social meetings. So you can have bingo nights or you can have virtual name tags, um, which are sort of a fun activity you can Google. And there are lots of different options on doing that where people try to guess who you are based on your description of the name tag. Um, trivia contests are good or either even just little things like um, having uh, a question that you pose to people and put them in breakout rooms to try to get to know each other. So there are a lot of different options that you can use both in a meeting where you're trying to get work done and outside of that space to try to bring some small talk back and get those relationships and, and bonds forged so that you have better meetings and more productivity in the workplace. Now, another thing that we often find when we get on Zoom is that people seem to talk uh, more than they would when they were in a regular meeting because they're staring at a screen of nothingness. All of us feel that anxiety whenever we talk to a room full of people, whether it's people in real space in real time or people virtually, that when we get nothing back, we nervously fill that space with our own speech. The problem is that silence in Western culture is dispreferred. Um, the norm is speech. And so when we don't hear a lot of speech coming back to us, it signals to us something's wrong. What we don't realize is our own comfort with silence is something that is strongly culturally and socially determined. And in fact, anthropological research suggests that we are socialized into our tolerance for silence very early on. So as children, we assign cultural and social value to silence. And this varies by our culture. What's really interesting is if you look at how this tolerance for silence varies across culture, we find that Americans are some of the least silence tolerant people around. Um, so if you are talking across in international um, lines, what you're going to often encounter are different tolerances for silence that affect the perception that those meeting attendees have about each other. If you're an American and you don't have a lot of tolerance for silence, then you're not only going to over talk, which is going to fill the space that someone else could have talked, you're also going to make people that have a lot more tolerance for silence feel like you're pushy and they're being over talked to and not given a, a place to speak. If you're on the other side and you're an American and you're talking to people, say actually from Finland or Japan where the tolerance for silence is much greater than for Americans, you're often gonna feel that they're unenthusiastic, they're disinterested and they're not good conversational participants. And, and a lot of times in meeting spaces, this can tend to make us feel like they're not actively participating and contributing anything. So what we find is these different norms for silence that we culturally bring in, 
Um, and this doesn't mean even if you're first generation, this could be several generations down the road because this is something passed along, may actually impact how what much you like each other and how well you listen to each other or value what the other one's saying simply because you were enculturated into different silence norms. One of the big takeaways from this is we've got to get a little more comfortable with silence um, and try not to over talk or fill the space with sort of this verbal space filling activity we do when we're facing nothingness on the other side. Zoom is simply a format that has a very different interactional capacity than face-to-face -face conversation. You can't talk at the same time on Zoom where you can do this. And actually we culturally encourage it in American culture to have overlapping speech. Uh, you also often are talking to silent muted people and it takes a while for them to unmute themselves. So when we ask a question, you have to give more time to get a response and not get nervous and jump in. Because when we do that, that what happens is we provide only one person's perspective or we push forward only one person's agenda. And this can often make people feel disenfranchised from meetings. So when you allow for silence, it gives room for others to speak. And when we are talking about silence, there's a flip side to silence and that's taking turns in conversation. And one of the biggest issues that we have in any kind of format where there's a meeting is how turn taking is distributed. So I want you to just think of a meeting that you had recently and try to remember who talked and when they talked and how long they talked for. Um, when you think back, what, who do you remember doing most of the talking? <laughs> Usually the person who is hosting it does all, most of the talking or all right, so, initiated it. All right, so the one with sort of the rank in the meeting, right? So that's tied to institutional rank or power in many ways. So it's often the person either with the highest status in the meeting. So if there's a vice president or a president um, there, often it is their turn to speak more often than others or the person that actually brought the meeting to session. All right, so, but think now for, in terms of participants, have you ever noticed any patterns or trends in who talks the most in mixed meetings? So meetings with a number of people from various backgrounds and um, it's, uh, there's an interesting public uh, example of this in the Supreme Court, yes. uh, which um, in terms of their meeting on Zoom or whatever technology they were using, changed their usual dynamic for their interactions with the uh, attorneys and amongst themselves and have, in fact, uh, recently uh, introduce turn taking uh, in their oral argument sessions. So it's an interesting uh, case study of uh, this dynamic. Uh, and uh, Justice Thomas, who notoriously has been the silent justice, suddenly was you know one of the most vocal uh, participants in the uh, in the arguments. That's right. Actually, the Supreme Court studies have been some of the most interesting in terms of turn taking because it's a it's often recorded. We it's easy to analyze, and you also have a really interesting uh, power dynamic because obviously yeah. the Supreme Court justices hold the most institutional power, and then you go on down from attorneys to witnesses, and so it's a very clear institutional rank. And but there's also gender and ethnicity involved in a lot of their cases. So we can look at how. Um, it's not just a matter of who's controlling the meeting, but we can also see how institutional and social power help determine how meeting turns get distributed. So when we talk about turn taking, just to describe what this means in case people aren't familiar with it, we're simply talking about the organized, structured and way in which participants in any conversation know how to take turns. A lot of times we alternate turns through a variety of, of means. One is self-selection. So that's when someone decides I'm going to take a turn and by either interrupting someone else or waiting for a turn transition point where there's silence or it's clear that someone else is done talking or raising their hand in some meetings um, might be a way that it's done. They self-select to talk. 
You can also have other selected talk where you might ask someone a question. That's a way to select someone as a next turn taker. Um, or you turn and look at them. Eye gaze is often a way that we select others, or you just turn your body to face them. And, and as you can see, those are things that actually only happen really in real meetings. Not It's really much harder to do that in virtual meetings because how do you know when I'm turning towards you, you don't even know where I am on your screen. Um, the other thing to think about is it's not just the physical space that might change the way that we can do turn selection. It's also who the participants are in the meeting has a, a really significant impact on how turn taking gets distributed. And this is where we find that when you have institutional or social power, when you're the dominant majority in a particular type of space, we find that that tends to determine how many turns on the conversational floor you get. People generally aren't even aware of this in a meeting. Instead, they might get impressions about people based on their turn-taking behavior. So when we encounter someone that takes up a lot of the floor space, we sometimes see them as pushy or annoying or a space hog or always having something to say, right? We've all been in those meetings where someone just seems to be talking all the time and they seem to know something about everything. And we often take away an impression of, of them that's not necessarily positive. On the flip side, when we see people not talking, not taking turns, we often think they have nothing to contribute, nothing to say, and that they're not a very valuable employee. The problem is actually that certain social and linguistic styles tend to dominate in these type of turn taking interactions. And it's probably not so much that certain people have more to say and other people have nothing to say, but that the social facts that brought them there, the backgrounds that they have prohibit them from saying more. Um, one place we see a huge amount of this is in how the sexes speak in meetings. Women historically have not been valued for their talk. This goes back to Roman antiquity, um, the idea that a silent woman is a virtuous and valuable woman. And we find that over history, for example, in the mid Middle Ages where women were um, uh, accused of being scolds and gossips and actually sometimes even prosecuted for sins of the tongue, that women's speech has long been undervalued how this translates into turn taking is we find that in workspaces and professional environments, women do not take as many turns, especially in meetings. This is in large part because of the historical background where women's talk is devalued, so they don't feel as safe talking in meetings. It's also that the dominant masculine culture institutionally tends to uh, allow men to feel more comfortable to take more turns on the floor. How this is really dangerous is uh, one, women are often perceived as not having much to say in meetings. And I think there was a really famous um, example in Japan, uh, where I think it was the prime minister, I can't remember exactly who it was that made a comment that women talk too much and have nothing to say in meetings and in, in political situations. And this unfortunately is actually not something that we find only when people get in trouble for saying it publicly, but in our everyday meetings, there are a lot of times that people feel this way as well. So how this translates is that women take fewer turns or when they start to take more turns, they're often um, more likely to be assumed to be pushy or aggressive or have not much value in what they say. So these ways that we do turn taking that we think are simply the way a meeting organically unfolds actually have much more to do with social attributes, uh, who has the institutional and social power than it does with simply who is most knowledgeable on a topic. Um, and what we find is a lot of times it's unintentional. It's not that um, men are dominant cultures. We find the same thing with minority speakers. They tend to speak less in meetings. It's not that they do this intentionally. It's that the, this is the way we have been enculturated to behave. This is the way that we have perceived who's valuable and who's not in terms of taking uh, speaking turns. And this ends up leaving only certain viewpoints um, shared in meetings and allowing others to dominate and discourage people that might have a lot to contribute and be really good at idea generating outside the box from speaking. So there are some ways we can ensure that conversations are more equitable, both in our, our regular lives, because this happens everywhere, but especially in meetings.
So one thing that we don't tend to do with this shift to virtual spaces is have any kind of communication policy that goes out in advance of the meeting. How many of you have ever had some sort of email or memo that has laid out the communication procedures for a Zoom meeting? Has anybody had that? I Bruce, have. You, have? you have? Okay, and did you send that out or did someone else? Tell me a little more about that. Do you want to go to B or go ahead? Yeah, go ahead first. Oh, for me. Um, I'd say like, for instance, whenever there's National Academies of Science meetings and uh, NIH meetings, they set out these uh, procedures, especially, especially National Academies, because they're very, they want to be very specific about these things. So organizations like that. Um, okay. And then we, we've also done it for some of our meetings as well. Okay. Uh, and Deborah, how about yours? Um, the meetings that I've attended that have had that in advance are giving instructions on when you're allowed to speak and how you're going to let people know that you're going to speak. Okay. So doing and those are, th those are both very advantageous, right? Because you know how it's going to proceed. Um, none of us have been trained in virtual meetings uh, and we should probably do this in regular meetings as well, but it's particularly important in virtual meetings because the virtual space tends to make us feel much more self-conscious and vulnerable than we are in, in actual space when we're in real, real time. Um, so it's very unusual for institutions to send out communication policies and procedures, but it's it's very valuable to do so. And so I'm happy to hear that there are places that do do it, but not enough places do it. And we we only tend to find it in places where, like the National Science Foundation, this is what they do, and they do it with a large number of people from all over the place. So that helps to have some sort of clear communication policy. In most meetings run by companies are smaller places. We don't find any kind of clear communication procedures set out. So you should put out procedures and expectations for participation in meetings and for behavior in meetings well in advance of the meeting. So how are you going to do the turn selection? Is it going to be self-selection? How, if you're doing self-selection, how are you going to indicate you want to turn to talk? Um, is it going to be by topic? So if you're addressing a certain topic, you expect people that work in that area to, to speak. I would bet many of you have had, even if you've had those procedures uh, sent out before a meeting, they didn't say how much floor time people should have. Uh, if you are telling people to self-select, it's particularly important to have limits on floor time because for every minute you take, you're taking that minute away from someone else. So having a limit of five minutes or whatever works depending on the time allotted for the meeting itself. Uh, another thing to talk about is are your cameras going to be on because that is really helpful to have cameras on to help encourage interactivity, connectedness, and some sort of shared social space. Uh, are, are you going to be muted or not? All of these things are things we take for granted that we rarely actually articulate in advance of a meeting. Once you've done this and you start your meeting, the other thing that's really important to make sure you give voice to those that might be hesitant or unable to speak in these contexts is to provide an alternate method of people talking and sharing their ideas that's not just self-selected um, turn-taking. One really good means is chat, the chat function to really encourage people and check the chat. That's really, really helpful. Um, and, and then a lot of times though, that's very hard if someone's talking. So it's really good to assign someone to model moderate the chat. And when you do that, you're much more assured of having those chat comments addressed because a lot of times those are the ones that get pushed back or missed, or you only take a subsection of them. So that then again, isolates you in terms of who's participating. Another option would be use the polling function a little bit more. Um, now this is anonymous a lot of times, so it can help people that wouldn't even use the chat that says who they're who's talking to let them get some ideas and this may not be uh, helpful in terms of of information generating but it could be helpful in terms of making sure you have true consensus before you move on to a new topic and another option is just to make sure there's some asynchronous way uh, so email or voicemail or um, sort of back channel communication that people can communicate ideas and thoughts that you give voice to in the meeting so that you welcome those types of alternate ways of getting in touch. A lot of times, you know, someone's not going to send an email because they don't feel it's been invited or comfortable 
they feel it might be weird to just send something as a back channel communication. But if you make sure there's space for that by inviting it, that can help people that don't feel they have had their say in the meeting. The other thing we have to be aware of when we are the meeting organizer, or the meeting manager, or the person who has status in the meeting is, are we seeing a pattern where the same people are always talking and others are not? And that this is actually devaluing the contributions of those people. And it may actually be hindering their job progress because when we don't hear from people in meetings, we tend to find a correlation with those who don't get promotion. So those that talk more in meetings tend to also be more visible for um, promotion and progress in a workspace. So when we see that happening, particularly if it's for women or a disadvantaged groups, we might need to consider intervention in how we allocate speaking terms in meetings so that everybody's expected to talk for a certain amount of time, or that we tell someone in advance of the meeting, I'd like you not to talk this meeting because we need to make sure we encourage participate for participation from other people. So sometimes you have to be a little more heavy handed in the way that we allocate and intervene when we see that this equitable distribution of turns is just not happening in an organic fashion. All right, and then lastly, in terms of how we can have more successful meetings is making sure that when we're adding our contribution to a meeting, that we're actually opening up conversation and idea generating rather than closing it down. A lot of times we don't realize that the way we say things actually um, encodes our stance to whatever we're saying without us even being aware that we're making our position on something clear. So a lot of times we will phrase something like, oh, my opinion is whatever, or I think that this topic should look, be looked at from this perspective, or we'll use some institutional authority in introducing a topic. Um, so for example, when I was talking to the journalist, it's often an editor um, or the people upstairs or the owners of the newspaper or the magazine that have an idea about how something should be done. But in other institutional contexts, it might be something like, oh, the boss or you know the president, or we give somebody else the authority to dictate the conversation and the direction it should take. Now, sometimes, yes, we're going to have to go the route that people with higher status or expertise might suggest. But if we really want open discussion and true idea generation that might be outside the box, we can't couch ideas and thoughts um, in other people's language. So we need to open up conversation by simply putting out topics for discussion before we articulate our particular stance or an institutional authority stance to those ideas. The best way to do this is simply say, hey, what do people think about X? And then after you've generated some conversation about it, you can come back and say, okay, well, those are great ideas. And maybe we need to then bring that up to the people upstairs because they think we should do this. And that allows real free discussion of those topics without having some sort of uh, institutional or authoritative stance projected on that before it's even come up for discussion. Another thing that we tend to do, and, and Zoom is a particularly bad place to do that, is say things like, well, if no one objects, we're going to do this. How much true space for objection is given when we say those types of things? Rarely do people actually pause and see if people object, um, nor do they, they say, okay, if, if someone does disagree, I want you to let me know. Either put it in the chat or send me an email, because if I get something like that, we'll talk more about it. Otherwise, I think we'll go with this way. That at least gives some space for true disagreement with which something like, oh, if no one disagrees, we're gonna do this, does. This is again a place where the polling function on Zoom or other virtual formats can be really helpful because before you just dismiss the fact that someone might disagree, you can actually say, so let's see if we have consensus on this. I'm going to suggest we do X. I'd like to see through the polling function if everybody agrees with me. That's a good way to anonymously get a true sense of whether you have real consensus or you just have your authoritative stance um, being projected there. So if we really want a diversity of ideas and we want the input of everybody at the table, there are some really concrete ways we can approach it in terms of the language that we use and the awareness we have of other people's language that can really help us open the floor to better conversation. And so now that's it. And I wanna open the floor to your conversation. So questions or thoughts? I'd like to just say, I, I've been living through virtual meetings and haven't given any thought to any of this 
you know, any real thought. And you just really opened up my mind just now to so many things that I've been either bothered by, or I said, oh yeah, that's exactly how I feel about the oversharers. Or, 